Good morning, good day, and good evening, and uh, welcome to this Stats Cafe on Big Data Governance. My name is Rika Hansen, and I'm currently in charge of uh, the Statistics Division of ASCAP. Now, Big Data, it generates a lot of enthusiasm and activity, big promises, big potential, but also some anxiety and a lot of big questions about how to use it, when to use it, who to use it, etc. The Stats Cafe today is going to be a discussion not about the technical issues and methodological aspects of how to make use of different types of big data. What we will be discussing is governance as it relates to big data uh, and the use of big data for official statistics. And why have we chosen this topic and this focus? Well, during the past year, year and a half, uh, SCAP has documented uh, a number of experiments, uh, experiments and experiences with big data all around Asia and the Pacific. And we have discussed and talked with statisticians working in statistical institutions, trying to get their heads around how to make use of this very promising uh, data source. Uh, we are very excited about the high level of activity. We see a lot of experimentation and very promise, promising experiments as well. Uh, when we do consult with the statisticians involved uh, on what challenges they experience, one resounding challenge relates, relates to, well, how do we go from an ex a, a phase of experience, uh, experimentation to integration of big data as part of our regular statistics production. And this is where governance comes in and the institutional environment comes in. This is where national data strategies are relevant. This is where statistics legislation is relevant. It's where how we set up and operate the whole national statistical system is relevant. Issues related to confidentiality, privacy, ethics, etc. Uh, so this is this is going to be the focus of the discussion today. And with us, we have uh, three excellent speakers and experts. And we also have a very knowledgeable moderator to help us through the discussions. And uh, what I will do now is to briefly introduce our moderator and then leave it in her safe hands to take us through the next hour, hour and a half. Uh, so our moderator today, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Ms. Irina Bernal. Irina has worked uh, with ESCAP for the past a, bit, a couple of years almost now. And uh, Irina has led much of the research and mapping efforts that uh, have been conducted <clears throat> by ESCAP uh, really across the Asia Pacific region and uh, has also been published in a number of uh, briefs and uh, materials that I hope many of you have already had the chance to look at. So without further ado, um, I will leave it to you, Irina. I will just mention one housekeeping since I'm hearing noise right now. All of you, please mute your microphones when you are not speaking. Uh, so with that note, Irina, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Rike. Uh, greetings, everyone. It is my great pleasure to moderate this Stats Cafe. Uh, today's session is about data governance and what it means for the national statistical systems. We have an excellent panel of speakers lined up today. Uh, we've brought to you three experts, one from the United Nations Statistics Division and two from national statistical offices who will discuss where the NSOs fit into the broader national uh, government data efforts and provide their examples um, of uh, their approach to this challenging 
uh, but increasingly important issue of governing big data from inside and outside the government for official statistics. Speakers have joined us across three continents and different time zones, so thank you very much for making it uh, to the session. Before we proceed to the presentations, a bit of housekeeping. Um, this meeting is conducted on MS Teams and is being recorded. Uh, the recording will be shared on our page so that you can go back to the examples and Q&A. We would appreciate if all of you keep your microphone on mute or our team will put um, uh, you on mute. And if you experience bandwidth issues, we encourage you to turn off the video. Also, on the right-hand side of the screen, there is the meeting chat. We encourage you to share your questions there and we'll address them during the Q&A session. And now let's uh, turn to the presentations. Our first speaker is Gabriel Gamez, who is currently the Interregional Advisor for the Organization and Management of National Statistical Systems at the UN Statistics Division. Mr. Gamez has an extensive experience in the area of official statistics from the Swiss Federal Statistics Office, European Free Trade Association Statistical Office, and the Economic Commission for Europe. Most recently, Mr. Gamas has been involved in the development of the new version of the UN Handbook on Management and Organization of National Statistics Systems, which also covers the use of big data for official statistics. Um, now I would like to invite Mr. Gamas to present. Thank you very much, Irina. Uh, thank you, Rike, uh, dear delegates, dear colleagues. I mean, it's a pleasure for me, even though in the middle of the night, of course, here in New York, to be with you and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, have the the pleasure uh, and the opportunity to to make a, a short intervention. I don't want to spend more time uh, since I have 10 to 15 minutes, and I would like to go directly to my presentation here. And Irina, please confirm that you have my uh, my first slides on the on the screen. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Very good. You can go so ahead. My, Yes, thank you. My my presentation will be about governance beyond the national statistical system, and I call it from data ruling, but it could have been also from a data or the statistical legislation to data stewardship. And I will tell you a little bit more what data stewardship is, and what kind of governance it is. One thing first, uh, and and it's for me quite important. I know I'm speaking to statisticians now and many official statisticians, but there is also sometimes a little bit of a confusion, and I like to take this example of an iceberg. I mean, of course, we're taking care a lot about our SDG indicators, but our SDG indicators is actually only the top of the iceberg. It's only what you can see what is outside the water. 90% of the material of the substance that allows this 10% to be outside the water is under the water. And among that, we have, of course, a national statistical system. We have all kind of data sources, but also key players like administrative records and data holders, citizen generated data, the private third party data or big data and other data community such as uh, researchers and academia. This is something that is quite important. And if we only try to maintain the top of the iceberg, but the water under the iceberg is getting too warm, the top is also going to disappear. So this is something that is important and we are trying all to, today to discuss how to keep this big piece of the iceberg under the water, I mean, uh, 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 alive, growing even so that the top will be beautifully out. The, the data ecosystem is a word that we use more and more to speak about the entire community of uh, uh, entities people collecting data, producing data, analyzing data, but also user or at least main community of data users. I mean, these one jointly, directly, indirectly collect, process, disseminate, analyze, as I said, or and consume data. It's a wide definition of the data ecosystem. It's also the definition that is used uh, in the handbook that was mentioned just a few minutes ago. Now, uh, let me just maybe jump to the next one and I come back. Among the data ecosystem, as you have seen before, you have different layers and different kind of producers and actors. Of course, one important one is what we call the national statistical system. 
And in that context, I will use a narrow definition of the national statistical system being all the producers of statistics that function according to the fundamental principles of official statistics, national statistical legislation, and other regional or sub-regional code of good practices. So we have on one side, and this seems to be rather clear to us, we have the National Statistical Office, and on the other side, we have these other producers of official statistics that uh, 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 operate in compliance with the statistical law and adopted standards. So this is a narrow part of the data ecosystem. The larger part are all the other actors. Some are public, like for administrative data, some are actually private, some are citizens when it comes to citizens generated data. The national statistical system is the ensemble of these producers. Now, if I come back and, and I have to go very quickly because I don't have too much time, but actually, I mean, of course, and we are well aware, we official statisticians, that we have a set of rules and principles that actually regulate our activities. We know about the UN fundamental principles of official statistics. We know about the UN National Quality Assurance Framework. The new one was actually uh, uh, submitted to the statistical uh, UN Statistical Commission, if I'm correct, two years ago and was endorsed. We have regional statistics code of good practices, like for example, the ASEAN code of practice. And when you will get uh, my slides, you will have the link here. You have also the national legal framework, like for example, the statistical legislation in some countries that are working strictly with a common law. They work also sometimes with national code of practices. We have two kinds of legislation. I mean, I would say uh, 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 um, in, in countries, you have countries that are working according to the common law and other one, but here it doesn't make now a big difference. And then we have the international guidelines, methodology, nomenclatures that are discussed and eventually endorsed in the ESCAP committee for statistics and sometimes also for in the in the UN uh, Statistical Commission. But that's not all. We have other set of actually uh, legislation in a country that rules or governs the or the overall data ecosystem. And here it's of course an example because every country is structured differently and has different kind of laws. But if you think a little bit, in many countries, they are the Privacy and Data Protection Act. This act actually governs personal data, the way the data is collected, the data, how the, the data is processed, how the data is shared by public and private operators or entities in, in the country. This is something that is very important. We have, of course, in mind this one from the European Union that have set, uh, I would say, a standard uh, worldwide on how to protect privacy, uh, but still allowing entities, public and private, to use the data and get the best out of the data. And we are part of the national data ecosystem. So basically, this is also something that is important to us. Some countries have on top of that the Public Information Access Act. Uh, this is more actually related to public data. And other one have also Archiving Act, which is about the rules uh, to archive data uh, that are of national interest. There are, of course, more. The handbook gives you a full list of these kind of legislations that can exist in a country and that are very important for us. And you can see the lady down there that is keeping an eye on that. This is something sometimes we statisticians forget. We have to be involved in the development of this. Uh, legal acts and follow up about any revision that is up to come. This I will I will speak a little bit more after. Uh, the coordination, we know what coordination in. In general, the coordination has advantages, not only for the national statistical system, but for the entire uh, uh, data ecosystem, because through uh, 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 coordination, we secure efficiency and synergy, effectiveness, quality, coherence, comparability and accessibility, but also eventually we can develop, and this is probably a little bit more for the national statistical system, but we develop through the coordination and the governance of a national statistical system, the identity and the trust in statistics. To some extent, this is true also for the overall, uh, I would say, data community, 
or the data ecosystem. But of course, this is something that is very clear for the for, na for official statistics. Now, if I go to the next one for the national statistical system, I'm not going to speak too long about that. We know what governance or coordination means, and we have at the international level two fundamental decisions or, 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 or principles that govern that. The principle eight of the UN fundamental principles that is very clear about coordination, but this principle that was actually endorsed by the UN Statistical Commission and then by the General Assembly, though it's not a uh, principle that are only valid for us, are principles that have been decided by our higher policymakers. But we have also more recently in 2017 in the General Assembly resolution on the SDG indicator framework, the General Assembly is saying very clearly that national statistical officers are the coordinators of the NSS, the national statistical system, and that all activities of the NSS to be conducted in full adherence to the fundamental principles of official statistics. And by this resolution, the General Assembly has in mind, I would say, the narrow definition of the national statistical system, because we also know that the private operator, they are not working according to the fundamental principle of official statistics. We can discuss further, we can discuss, and this is a point also about ethics uh, that should apply to the data ecosystem, but the fundamental principles are more uh, focusing on the national statistical system. But the General Assembly is also saying something important, and this was mentioned by Rike in the opening, is that NSS should, must explore ways to integrate new data sources to satisfy ne new needs or emerging data needs of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And this is a point that is very important. Now, we cannot have a long presentation about what these kind of data are. We're discussing about big data. Sometimes I prefer to use actually the term of private third party data, because among the big data, some are very big and some are less big. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, this is now not the, a, a very important point. So we have seen coordination for the national statistical system. So what could be the governance beyond the national statistical system? What can a national statistical office, and in particular the chief statistician, do in order to bring efficiency, in order to bring coherence, in order to improve the access to the entire data ecosystem? Uh, there is actually, we came up with a term that is called data stewardship. And there was data stewardship is not something that is totally new, and you will see why but is an approach to data governance that is not the same thing as coordinating the national statistical system that is accountable for enabling the development, processing, storage, and fitness for purpose of data in the interest of the entire data ecosystem, but also sometimes for a smaller consist consistency thereof, right? So a smaller group within the entire eco data system. The data stewardship, is in general not operating in service of, rather than, uh, it's, it's in general operating in service of, rather than in control. And this is also a little bit different than in the national statistical system. In the national statistical system, the statistical office tends to control or to impose some rules. There we are working in service of the, of, of the data ecosystem, in service of the holders of big data or private third party data. Data stewardship is not about getting or transferring ownership, or let's say not systematically, right? But it's also about or more about sharing and collaboratively improving across the data ecosystem, governance, data interoperability, and production processes, but also know-how and technology uh, uh, about data, data processing, data archiving, data sharing, confidentiality rules, etc. So data stewardship, and this is what I was telling you before, we are speaking now that a lot about that in the data ecosystem, but this is actually a concept that was introduced many years ago in the business sector. And in very big company, you have a data steward that actually is playing this role to bring some coherence and consistency to all the data that is produced within a company. Um, now, why, why actually data stewardship is something that is not exactly the same as the coordination as we know it in the national statistical system, and also not exactly the same thing as what is foreseen in the statistical law. 
It could be in the gloss, the generic law and official statistics, but also on some aspect of the handbook dealing exclusively with the national statistical system. Is that on one side, and you can see on the left, you have the authority. So actually the power, the authority through the law that is given to the chief statistician. And on the other side, you have the data stewardship. So basically a lot of soft skills that enable the chief statistician to govern the data ecosystem. And we can see, and this is taken from the gloss from the generic statistical law, that of course the chief statistician is the boss of the National Statistical Office. So there is no discussion. We have 100% authority, but we are not going to govern through stewardship, right? This is pure authority. On the other producer of official statistic, the chief statistician may issue standards and guidelines. It's still something that is very strong, right? It's still something that is very strong, even though the chief statistician is not the boss of the uh, entity in the central bank, for example, producing the balance of payment. However, some standards and guidelines can be issued by the chief statistician. If we go one level further, we have administrative data and statistics producers. Here, the gloss is a little bit already more balanced, saying that if providers of administrative data plan to develop a new data collection or carry out a major revision in their data collection or processing, they shall consult the National Statistical Office. We have already the, the word consultation. We have also shall and not should, right, which is important. But still, we're already in the level of consultation. There is a little bit more stewardship there. And for the last level, what we're discussing, the third party private data or big data, the chief statistician may promote the use of standards, terminology, classifications and technology applied in official statistics among public and private data providers and operators. And as I told you before, it is not only because the statistical office is interested only in getting access to these data and produce official statistics with uh, big data. It's also in the interest of the overall data ecosystem. And my, I'm convinced that if we, if we want the National Statistical Office to have an impact on big data, we should not only govern big data or the entire data ecosystem in our own interest of getting the data for us for the production of official statistics, but we have to look at the entire uh, national data ecosystem. And then, <clears throat> I mean, the last one I will not spend time on is that it's always good, whatever the data you have access to, to use a member of memorandum of understanding with the data providers. And one important step is actually to discuss the different legal basis or contractual arrangements of each party when we enter into a discussion. I will not go through all the points. The only element that I wanted to tell you is that it's very also important. It's very important to discuss there the cooperation mechanisms for improving the adequacy of the data with statistical requirements. This is something that is fundamental. We can discuss it later, of course, to what are the elements to be in an MOU. But if I go further, I have here a couple of questions that we could discuss later on about what is data stewardship. How can we make sure that the data ecosystem is flourishing, right? And we know that the flower that is on the top, it's a sunflower that is on my left, if the top are the sustainable development goals, if what is in green is a national statistical system, if the roots are actually the data sources, what is the earth is a data ecosystem? If we don't take care of the data ecosystem, the plant is going to die and including with the plant also the flower. So actually we would kill the, uh, the SDG indicators and all our work we are doing in order to inform progress uh, towards the SDG sustainable development goals. With that, I'm, uh, I'm done. Thank you very much, uh, Irina. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Gomez, for such an excellent presentation and for illustrating um, the normative frameworks that are beyond the national statistical systems, but an integral part of the national data ecosystems, and also for highlighting the role of coordination for a sound data governance. Um, you've also highlighted that data stewardship is about operating in the service of rather than in control of data ecosystems. And I particularly like that you ended your presentation with some thought provoking questions. 
and hopefully we'll get responses, at least partial to some of them, as we move to concrete examples of how big data governance um, um, by national statistical offices is shaping up, especially as these NSOs are taking on the stewardship role that you mentioned in your presentation. In the next presentation, we'll hear from Simon uh, Whitworth about the UK's experience of regulating big data for official statistics. Uh, Mr. Whitworth um, is the head of um, data ethics and research governance at the UK Statistics Authority. In this role, Mr. Whitworth leads the development and provision of research governance frameworks and services providing efficient and effective research governance across UK research community and provide strategic advice to independent research governance panels. Mr. Whitworth also leads the work of the UK Statistics Authority Centre for Applied Data Ethics. The centre provides applied data ethics guidance, training and support to researchers and statisticians across the analytical community. It also provides an international uh, research programme focusing on ethical issues in the use of data for research and statistics. Prior to this appointment, Mr. Whitworth played a lead role in the policy design and operationalization of the statistics and research strands of the Digital Economy Act 2017 and led research teams using big data to improve official statistical outputs. Mr. Whitworth, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, try and share my slides. Uh, so just bear with me a minute. Uh, can you see those? Yes, it's great. All right, brilliant. Uh, so thank you for that introduction and thank you for the invite to speak at uh, this event. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk as the uh, as the title suggests about how our statistical regulatory framework here in the UK enables the use of big data. I'm going to talk about uh, the lead role that we in the UK Stats Authority have played in, um, in developing this statistical regu uh, regulation and indeed operationalizing uh, the regulation. Um, I'm also going to talk about the lessons we've learned as we've gone about this journey. And then finally, I'll finish with how we plan uh, to build upon this work um, uh, and as part of the broader national digital transformation uh, strategy to access uh, big data. So hopefully that is of interest to at least uh, some in the virtual room. I can't see anybody uh, switching off, so I'll take that as a, as a positive and plough on. So before I do all of that, I wanted to just uh, spend a few moments um, to talk about who we are in the UK Stats Authority. Um, so we're an independent body at arm's length uh, from uh, the government. Uh, the Office for National Statistics, um, which is the UK statistical producer, is the executive office of uh, the UK uh, Statistics Authority. And uh, we're here to uh, promote uh, and safeguard the production and publication of official statistics uh, that serve the public good. So uh, by serving the public good, we mean uh, informing the public about socioeconomic matters and assisting in the development and evaluation of, uh, of public policy. We also have a, a regulatory arm, the Office for Statistical Regulation, uh, that regulate the quality of uh, statistics from across the statistical system here in the UK and uh, publicly challenge uh, uh, the misuse of uh, statistics. So latest five year strategy, which was published uh, last summer, um, sets out our mission as uh, producing high quality data and analysis to inform uh, the UK, improve lives and uh, build the future. The legislative context in which uh, in which we work is an important enabler uh, to to help us achieve those ambitions. And it's something that over the last few years we've worked um, incredibly hard on to shape uh, so that we can ensure that we have statistical legislation uh, that enables us to efficiently access a wide range of data for research and statistical purposes. So uh, prior to this work, the legislative context in the UK 
um, was seen as a significant barrier uh, to enabling the access and use of data for analytical purposes. So I've picked on this slide, I've picked two examples of independent reviews that were done um, uh, before this work commenced um, that uh, uh, pointed to the issues with the, with the statistical legislation and how it was holding back um, uh, statistical improvements. So in, back in 2016, Sir Charles Bean, who uh, uh, led an independent review of the UK's e economic statistics, uh, said that he uh, concluded that the UK significantly lacks many ad other advanced economies in its exploitation of administrative data. And this reflects both the cumbersome nature of the present legal framework governing the sharing of such data and a cultural reluctance on part of on the part of some departments and officials to data sharing. Going even further back to 2012, the Administrative Data Task Force, which was a, a group of eminent academics and uh, government representatives who were uh, given the task of, uh, of suggesting ways to overcome barriers to data for the research community. They concluded that primary legislation should be sought to provide a generic legal gateway for research and statistical purposes that enabled efficient access to and linkage between admin data held by different government departments. So armed with this um, long standing uh, body of evidence, um, the UK Stats Authority um, uh, positioned itself really as an important driver behind the Digital Economy Act, uh, which passed through Parliament in 2017. So broadly speaking, the Act uh, reduces barriers uh, to access for data for specific purposes. Um, so the graphic on the right, um, this shows the, the, the data sharing aspects of the legislation. And um, the, these sought uh, to give uh, government powers to share information across uh, departmental boundaries uh, for a number of uh, purposes, including uh, improving public service delivery, uh, reducing fraud uh, against the public sector, and rather helpfully for us, those ones in uh, those ones circled in red, in um, uh, improving the production of uh, UK national and official statistics and access to data for research purposes. So that's access to um, uh, for the academic community, uh, the commercial sector research, research community, access to government data in de-identified form uh, for them to produce research uh, for the for the public good. So um, we've played, as I said before, we've played a lead role in the development and operationalization of um, the statistics and research part, parts of the legislation. Uh, and so we've done this by uh, providing policy leadership of um, the statistics uh, legislation. And that allowed us to uh, work with stakeholders from across um, the stakeholder community to shape that legislation to give us a right of access to data for statistical and research purposes from um, both uh, other public authorities of the government of the departments uh, and indeed um, the commercial sector. It also enabled us uh, to put a duty on those who were providing us with data for statistical pur uh, purposes. It enabled us to provide a duty on them to consult statisticians on changes uh, to data systems so that we don't build a statistical production process um, that's reliant on something that, that, that may significantly change and we can't do anything about it. Um, um, those who are providing us with data have to um, let us know that things will change and therefore we can take that into account for our um, statistical uh, production processes. We also act as an accreditor for the research strand of the legislation. So this is data flowing out from government in de-identified form to uh, the commercial sector, to um, uh, the, uh, the academic sector for research in the public good. Um, and the role that we play there is to uh, essentially accredit uh, the, um, the the researchers that use that gateway um, to so train them to ensure that they they can use the data safely. Um, we also um, accredit the research projects that um, happen under that gateway. So essentially, that's sort of making an independent judgment that that research is in the public good, which it has to be to 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 be legal. 
And we also work with a number of different uh, organisations across the UK who provide data processing environments to enable um, external researchers to access data in, in, safe, in safe ways. So to do this, uh, we developed uh, codes of practice. Uh, so these set out the, I guess, the high level uh, governance principles by which um, uh, we commit to using the legal gateway. And these were uh, these were approved by Parliament back in 2017. So this shows the code of practice uh, for the statistics strand of the Digital Economy Act, uh, which includes uh, commitments to consult with data suppliers uh, before we request access to data. So we do this in a, a sort of collaborative fashion. Uh, we maintain appropriate security controls uh, to ensure personal information remains protected and secure at all times. Uh, we uh, will act in a transparent fashion, so we publish uh, information on the data that we access and, um, and the research that we do um, by, through accessing that data. We ensure um, that data access arrangements and use observe the highest uh, ethical standards and are legal, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, we take, decision, uh, take decisions on the data sources we seek to access only on the basis of sound statistical rationale and a clear public interest. So there must be a statistical need for the data for us to uh, access it, and uh, we must be able to produce statistics that are in the public interests. And finally, last but not least, uh, we, uh, we we behave in a, a proportionate manner, uh, ensuring that the costs of providing us with access to data are proportionate to the benefits that can accrue from the statistics um, that are produced from the data we ask for. So we've developed a similar code of practice uh, for the research strand of the digital economy, which um, I've not got time to go into uh, now because I've promised uh, to uh, shut up after 15 uh, minutes, but which I can share across this group if people are, uh, are interested. I promised at the start that I would speak about, um, uh, about some of the challenges and some of the lessons that we've learned uh, through, through this journey. And so to keep to my promise, I think one of the, um, one of the most significant challenges we've had is turning these sort of high level principles uh, into frameworks that can be efficiently applied uh, to real life research uh, research projects and therefore enable um, data to flow uh, and be used for research and statistical purposes uh, quickly but safely uh, and in ways which are consistent with the law um, and are publicly acceptable. Um, so focusing on a particular interest uh, of mine as head of data ethics, um, the, the, the data ethics principle that I talked about in the early slide. So we've put a lot of effort over the last few years in uh, into helping researchers uh, consider the ethics of their research. So providing applied support, uh, applied services, to, to, to assist them and enable them to access data in and empower them to access data in ethically appropriate ways. So back in uh, the start of this year, actually, we launched uh, something called the Center for Applied Data Ethics, which provides applied data ethics services and, uh, and advice to uh, analysts from across the analytical system. So um, what we do there, what we do in, in with this centre is provide a suite of, of, of materials uh, for researchers to to refer to and, and, and advice services for them to use. So this includes um, an ethics self assessment tool, which I'll talk a bit more detail about in a minute, uh, which enables researchers to self assess the ethics of their research against various ethical principles and therefore in doing that um, identify and mitigate uh, any ethical uh, ethical risk that their, their research may have. Uh, we have also got an independent uh, expert uh, ethical advice uh, service through the National Statisticians Data Ethics uh, Advisory Committee, or NSDEC for short, which provides um, fast, uh, independent expert advice uh, for researchers who, who, who need it. Uh, we've done a lot of work providing ethics training for research and uh, for the research and statistical community across government, academia, and the commercial sector. 
Uh, and as I say, this this really is the aim of this is to empower them to feel confident to use data ethically. Uh, we also provide an ethics user support service. Uh, so that's where there are people within the team who um, sit with researchers as they are designing new research and uh, help them to consider uh, consider the, the ethics of that research. Um, really to provide applied support at the um, research design phase and therefore, therefore promote a culture of ethics by design. And then last but not least, we have, we, we've published a series of uh, guidance on cross-cutting ethical issues in uh, research and statistics. So we've published things uh, to help researchers articulate the public good of their research. Uh, we've published guidance on the use of geospatial data. We're shortly going to publish guidance on the use of machine learning, on uh, how to understand and, and, and to gather uh, public acceptability for your for, uh, for your research. So a whole range of, of topics that we found over the last few years, um, some in the analytical community have struggled with, uh, we're providing um, uh, applied advice and guidance to help them navigate through some of those issues. Um, so this is the aforementioned ethics self-assessment tool. Uh, where researchers self-assess their work against a range of ethical aspects to produce uh, an overall ethical risk score. Um, this is supported uh, by uh, guidance and expert user support uh, to help analysts um, uh, uh, through this process. So I think the, the point I really want to make is we're not just leaving uh, analysts to do this on their own. Uh, we support them through the process and provide the resource to support them through the process to help them access and use data in ethically appropriate ways. So this is one example of where we put in place uh, supporting governance in, uh, 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 support in governance structures and advice services uh, to ensure that the opportunities that the uh, Digital Economy Act presents uh, can be fully uh, realised by the analytical community. So I suppose um, our experience has taught us uh, that it's not just about um, getting uh, legislation that's enabling, it's also about having uh, the supporting infrastructures in place to enable analysts to use that enabling legislation to access and use big data in ways that are, are ambitious, uh, obviously consistent with the legislation and are, and are publicly, uh, publicly acceptable. So in other words, it's more than just about having um, high level governance principles, uh, which uh, look good on a website or on a piece of paper. I think the real challenge is uh, ensuring that those high level principles are used by the analytical community and um, and uh, and are enabling and have uh, have impact. So talking of impact, these are the um, the impacts of the work that I've I've, I've spoken uh, about uh, today. So ONS has accessed 125 new distinct data sources through the statistics strand of the digital economy since um, it came into being. Furthermore, we've accredited 250 research projects. Um, enabling access to over 80 data sets from multiple uh, public authorities through the DEA, through the research strand of the DEA. DEA. So as I said before, this is de-identified data, uh, linked to uh, de-identified data that's flowing to academic researchers, commercial sector researchers, uh, third sector researchers uh, for research uh, that's in the public good. And then on the ethics self-assessment, we've had over 450 users of um, the ethics framework, the ethics self-assessment tool over the last uh, couple of years, and they've come from across the whole sort of analytical system. So we're really playing a, a really strong leadership role in this. It's not just across um, government or across the NSI, it's also across uh, academia and the commercial sector where those researchers have looked to uh, access government data. They're using our sort of ethics frameworks and ethics tools to enable them to 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 do that. Um, so in terms of the future, um, last year the UK government published the National Data Strategy, uh, which um, sets out a strategy sets out a strategy to drive the UK in building a world-leading data economy 
where, while ensuring public trust in data use. The strategy commits to driving the use of the Digital Economy Act powers as a way of removing barriers um, to, data, um, to data sharing. Um, ONS are playing a lead role uh, in, um, in enabling the um, national data strategy by establishing a um, integrated data service, uh, which essentially um, uh, this will provide controlled access to integrated data from across government that has been built for analytical purposes by analysts um, uh, from across the analytical community. Uh, so this will enable faster and lower co lower cost analysis through streamlined access arrangements and departmental um, collaboration. So that's work that's in its infancy and that we're, uh, the, the office is, is working hard to um, drive forward currently. Finally, um, <laughs> if you forgive me, this is a blatant plug. Uh, for some work that we're doing uh, for the in, in the Centre for Applied Data Ethics, but I think maybe of interest to some here. So if you're interested in the data ethics work that we're doing, we're currently um, leading an, an international collaboration to share learning in, in data ethics. Many NSIs are dealing with similar sort of data ethics issues, and we think there's there's tremendous uh, potential in, in getting together to talk about that so we can all sort of move forward. Um, so this is based currently this is based around three deep dive top, uh, topics. So data ethics policies. So what policies, data ethics policies, do different NSIs have? How do they, how do they, uh, how are they similar? How do they, do they differ? What can we learn from them? Uh, ethically maximizing the utility of data for research and statistics. So I suppose that means um, how can we maximize the utility of data for research and statistical purposes? but also um, uh, you know, ensure that we behave in ethically appropriate ways. And then distinguishing between statistical and operational uses of data. So from our early collaboration with various partners across the world, these are, uh, are topics that um, various NSIs are grappling with at the moment, and we're trying to come together or coordinate um, uh, uh, different NSIs coming together to um, uh, to share experiences really and share learnings. So if people are interested in that, then uh, you will be more than welcome. The work is is in its kickoff phase really, as opposed to being well advanced. So it's a good if you, if you are interested, um, then it's a good time to get on board. And if you're interested, how do you get interested? How do you get involved? Well, um, you can contact me on uh, that uh, email address. Similarly, if you're interested in any of the stuff, any of the guidance that I mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, that's all available on the UKSA's um, website, which is um, which is uh, listed there. So hopefully I have myself behaved in an ethically appropriate manner and have kept to my promise of um, uh, keeping to 15 minutes. If not, uh, blame it on the fact that it's six o'clock in the morning here in the UK and uh, therefore I'm probably not at my best. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Mr. Whitworth, for a very insightful presentation on how the regulatory framework contributes to the use of big data for official statistics in the UK. It was an excellent presentation and it was very interesting to see how in the example of the UK, the Digital Economy Act governs data sharing for public service delivery and civil registration, but also for statistics and research. Um, thank you, Mr. Whitworth, for bringing the data ethics angle to your presentation, as it is always an area of big concern for many NSOs in our region, but beyond. And the ethics self-assessment tool looks like a great guiding tool for the NSO. So um, those of you participants who are working in the area of uh, data ethics, privacy, please don't get, um, don't hesitate to get uh, in touch with Mr. Uh, Whitworth for more uh, information and um, directly get involved in, uh, in any of the projects of your interest. Uh, we're now moving to the next speaker to hear about big data governance in Asia and the Pacific region. Uh, Mr. Setia Pramana will guide us through the big data governance framework at BPS Statistics Indonesia. 
Uh, Mr. Pramana is currently an associate professor at the Computational Statistics Department at Polytechnic Statistica STAS Indonesia, and also the coordinator of statistical model development and big data team at VPS Statistics Indonesia, which is a multidisciplinary team that is responsible for developing big data for official statistics. Before we move to Mr. Pramana's presentation, I would like to encourage our participants to share their questions, if they have any, in the chat box on the right, so that we'll start addressing them after Mr. Pramana's presentation. Also, please um, indicate which speaker you're addressing uh, the question to. Uh, Mr. Pramana, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Irina, for a uh, nice introduction. Can you please confirm whether you can see my presentations? Yes. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you for, uh, first of all, I'd like to say it's an honor for me to uh, be in this Stat Cafe, as an in NSCAP Stat Cafe and to discuss uh, big data governance for official statistics. And then we have uh, two distinguished uh, speakers from New York and so from London with different time uh, zone that will be uh, interesting as well. So uh, so I'm Sete Pramana from BPS Statistics Indonesia as already uh, introduced by Irina. So uh, the rapid development of big technology as a result of increasing and uh, some uh, online system between human and machine has led to new era of measurement revolutions. And these uh, big data sources, as mentioned by previous speakers as well, is already available now, called so-called third-party data, uh, and it can be easily accessed uh, for almost all uh, citizens. And this massive data is being used by, by businesses, uh, researchers, and also governments for public policy. And then uh, we see the, the big data right now is as one of data sources on statistical production, this uh, census, survey, and also administrative data. And the steps of producing statistics is the same, uh, or you, although we use the big data, it's the same to follow the generic statistical business process model uh, proposed by UNSCEs. And big data can provide innovative uh, real time and also more granular insight of, for national economic, for example, and can be an innovative data source for production of official statistics. And big data is clearly uh, clearly have a significant role to, uh, to play in any field, including official statistic productions. And this uh, big data can enable NSO like uh, uh, BPS Statistics Indonesia to provide high quality statistics and also in real time. Data, especially big data, need to be governed in order to manage risk and more importantly to extract uh, values from the data. And big data governance already met, already discussed by the previous uh, speaker also is uh, needed to create new analytics and result values from uh, uh, from the data and then with uh, the same objective of the organizations. So on this talk, uh, I was asked. Uh, to present the, the plan of BPS, uh, the big data governance that's being designed by our team. As I mentioned by uh, Irina is multidisciplinary team. Uh, we expect to have feedback and also comments on the plan because this is still uh, under uh, developments. So uh, first of all, before we go for the data governance, we, we see the regulation framework of statistical activities. So although there are not yet specific big data regulation in Indonesia, however, the utilization of big data and data governance in big data might imply in this regulation I stated in these uh, slides. First is uh, law number uh, 1697 and also the regulation of 5199 on uh, statistics and also uh, conducting uh, conduction of statistics. These two uh, uh, regulations state the cutting edge technology uh, utilization on uh, every statistical business process. And uh, in DKRA BPS in 2000s, defined that Indonesian national statistical system as institution of uh, uh, consisting of parts that include statistical data uh, requests, resources, methods, and also infrastructures, and also science, and also technology. 
here uh, in National uh, Strategic System, BPS act as a leading agency and coordinating uh, the statistical activities and clearing house for statistical uh, products. Later in uh, 19, uh, 2018, uh, we have the presidential regulation number 95, which concerned uh, about the electronic based government system or SPBE, uh, in which enhanced the development of framework for the use of big data and also a artificial intelligence in supporting public services. Later in 2019, um, presidential, presidential regulation number 39, it concerned about one uh, Indonesian data or Satu Data Indonesia. It launched to produce uh, accurate, up-to-date, integrated and accountable data and the data can be easily accessed and shared between central and also regional agencies. Um, at the end of 2019, government regulation number 80, uh, this is one, um, a, a one regulation that related to the trading through uh, electronics system. It states that all the companies that trade using electronic system in Indonesia must report their data to government, uh, to government statistical agencies. And to adapt uh, with disruption era, especially after we have a pandemic where the, the digitalization is massively uh, adopted by all the country, uh, BPS Digital Transformation is formally stated by the head of the Central uh, Statistic Agency number 33 in 2021. It con it's about digital, the digital transformation of the BPS. And in practice now, the dominant source of big data uh, uh, big data come from in the internet, right? So it's open to polemics regarding the issue of uh, personal confidentiality and also it uh, different aspect of uh, data protections. So uh, Indonesia is now uh, have or be hopefully to have a personal data protection bill that is now being discussed by the parliament and this is uh, one of the 20, 21 legislation priority. So we have to uh, have this to protect the data, especially for big data, for uh, uh, data protection, especially for confidentiality and also for user, uh, uh, for user uh, confidentiality. And then uh, BPS have done several big data initiatives. Uh, this is, if you see that we have uh, different um, uh, initiative in BPS of big data. We use web scrolling and also Google uh, Facebook mobility index, satellite imagery and mobile phone data. For web crawling, uh, there are several websites that we op uh, we obtain. We uh, from marketplace, flight tracker, job vacancy, online booking and air quality, weather reporting website, online news and social media. This uh, is this is uh, being used for supporting uh, different type of data for market uh, e-commerce data, transformation statistic, labor analysis, from occupancy rates related to number of tourism uh, visitors, environmental and also disaster statistic. And at the end, we also use the online news for uh, uh, observing the current phenomenon, also uh, getting the citizen sensing. And for satellite imagery, which one of the, our uh, focus research for uh, this year uh, is being used for uh, sampling uh, frame area for uh, agricultural, also for poverty mapping. For mobile positioning data, uh, which also collaboration with national uh, mobile network operator, which will be discussed uh, in the next uh, um, start cafe, this uh, mobile positioning data is being it was used for uh, obtaining number of international and domestic visitors and also for uh, metropolitan statistical area for different uh, metropolitan uh, cities in Indonesia. However, we we face uh, though we have a uh, big data implementation or initiative right initiative in BPS, we face several challenges as follows. First is data access and acquisition because it's owned by the third parties, for mostly by the, the, the private company. And uh, data sources quality, different uh, uh, data have different quality. If you get the data from uh, re from cross-sourcing, it might contain the, the, un, the, un, the non valid data, the non-informative data. And then to, from, uh, to use the data, a big data, as the official, we need to have statistical methodology included 
including the uh, representativeness, whether we can combine that with the uh, with the traditional uh, approaches, traditional data, and etc. And also, the next challenge is to have the new skill uh, profile and technology. Uh, we develop a team which come from different uh, profile, skill profile, and also the technology, uh, uh, the cutting edge technology being used right now. The, the, the fifth uh, challenge is the data privacy and protections, and also the regulation of national statistical system right now. Uh, Indonesia uh, government also uh, initiate several big data and artificial intelligence research. For example, the national artificial intelligence strategy we have, uh, which is uh, divine the blueprint of uh, AI development in Indonesia. And also big data research priority consortium, which consists of uh, uh, governments, academics, industries, and also communities. Also, we have artificial intelligence research consortium, which consists also the same uh, stakeholders. And lastly, for um, managing the pandemic situations, we have a COVID-19 research and innovation consortium, which uh, led by National Research and Innovative, Innovative Agency of Indonesia. So, uh, big data. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, data need to be the, the governance. Big data is defined as emerging set of process, method, and technology, and also practice that enable the rapid discovery, collections, and analysis, storage, and also to to get the, the to reveal the data, the value of the data. And this, uh, the the most important of big data governance is to maximize the value of the data that we have to for uh, the public use. Uh, this is the, the the draft of BPS Big Data uh, Governance Frameworks. Uh, I already mentioned before that we do not have yet the Big Data Governance practice that we use right now. This is the, the draft. Then uh, hopefully the feedback of all the participants, all the speakers are very welcome. Uh, this figure is just about the if you look at here, we have a goal. So the goal, the first goal, the the, the, the object of the big data service is to derive uh, the create uh, values. So the goal is to 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 get the values from the data and also through a new analysis methods. And then we go for uh, the the next layer is principle. So we have the principles: data protection, privacy, security, stewardship. Or define uh, discussed previously the first speaker Gabriel and also for optimization, excellence, assets. And then uh, the, the next uh, principle is related to fairness, equitability, transparency, ownership, agency, and also inventory. And then to uh, the strategies, uh, the, the, the next is strategies layer. This is used to, this layer is used to comply the principles defined above, right? The first strategy is to, to to, to make sure the personal information protections and also the data quality and also the data disclosures. And to, uh, to uh, sorry, wait, sorry, okay. To uh, perform all the, the strategies, principle and the goal, there are several uh, components uh, need to be uh, available. First is the organizations, which consists of the structures of management, the board of enterprise assistants or data risk uh, officers, data steward, and etc. And also uh, organizational change management, planning priority, and etc. And then this is all uh, controlled by audit and control. And uh, uh, standard and guidelines. This is this uh, component uh, uh, define the, the taxonomy of data definitions, the metadata, data management, the reference data, and as a process, guidelines of processing, and etc. And the, the third uh, component is policies and process. This include uh, that we are work, uh, that are, are, we are already doing now is big data processing from big data collection, big data pre-processing and processing, big data analytics, and then uh, dissemination, and then up to the visualizations. And then the measurement and also monitoring then uh, by compliance and business process integrations. Uh, this, uh, all the big data governance must uh, supported by IT infrastructures that uh, already uh, we already also developed some uh, infrastructure. I briefly uh, show the big data infrastructure developed by our team, uh, Directorate of Central Information Statistics in BPS. We, we, we different big data sources can be um, uh, can be obtained, and then all these data sources included or or collected in the collecting system, and then 
after the collecting system, it is then transferred to enterprise digital lake, a single sort of truth with different technology, depends on the type. We have real time, also maybe streaming process, and also some, uh, if you related to some uh, deep learning method, you can use different uh, type of infrastructures. And then we, we do, we can, we can use the business uh, b, uh, business intelligence tools such as Kovac and Power BI and also other tools for uh, extracting the uh, the insight of the data. Uh, this is also if we if we use the big data basis process uh, based on the GSPBM, all the the step in the, these uh, phases is included in big data from specified needs designing building the building the data sources rule and also algorithms and uh, how to collect the data from how to get data directly from the resources from the uh, well, maybe from scrapping or from machine to machine process and how to manage the data flow monitoring and then uh, the pre-processing uh, also include how to because with the data the data usually have a, a um, artifacts so we need to do some data cleansings and also information extractions and also machine learning included in this process and then after that for analysis uh, dissemination and also later to evaluate the system the process so i was asked also to uh, discuss the one data so uh, satu data indonesia or uh, one data uh, indonesia is the government's uh, data uh, governance data governance uh, policy to produce data that is accurate, up to date, right, integrated and compatible, uh, and it can be shared and assessed between uh, central agencies and also regional agencies through compliant with standards data, metadata, data interoperability, and also reference codes. So this is the uh, 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 the principle: data standards, metadata, interoperability, and reference code, and also BPS as uh, uh, data steward uh, uh, is um, responsible to establish data standard applies across uh, central and regional agencies, uh, establish standard structures and format of metadata, provide recommendation and data collection, examine the data priority and also conducting guidance on implementation of one data in accordance with the uh, legislations. So to combine the as um, uh, Satu Data Indonesia, Big Data, and etc. Uh, we also we our team have developed a, a platform in Indonesia Data Hub or INDA, which uh, combine all the information from Satu Data Indonesia for also from from different stakeholder from uh, from private and also from uh, different uh, organization from communities, and then we they we can combine all the data into one platform where this platform can. Uh, people can contribute directly and also to share the data to share the knowledge method and others and also users uh, with of course there are some uh, uh, governance the user can do collaboration and also exploration of the data such as analysis tabulation and officialization and then the data can the result of the data collaborate analysis can be shared through uh, social media, for example, or to uh, for other uh, to other uh, users, and this uh, data integrate a different type of format, technology, and etc. And then we we plan to in, uh, input the uh, include the flood artificial intelligence to support the uh, data ontology and machine learning. So uh, that's uh, the plan. So for the future actions for our team. Uh, is to finalize the uh, data governance and also implement that and then uh, institutional strengthening for big data implementations and we, we already have a uh, draft of bps big data and ai roadmap now we're planning to have that uh, uh, in more detail and more complete and then later to uh, implement big data and artificial intelligence in indonesian national statistical system uh i I hope that's already 15 minutes or less, Irina. So thank you for uh, all your um, uh, attentions and hopefully all the things requested have been covered. Thank you very much. I put uh, back to Irina. Thank you so much, Mr. Pramana, for taking us through the evolution of big data regulations in Indonesia and sharing BPS statistics approach to big data governance. So within the Indonesia One Data Policy uh, Framework, uh, one thing that I've retained is that BPS statistics actually plays a, 
a data stewardship role, providing guidance um, to trustees as data providers to ensure um, that uh, one data principles are well respected. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all of our speakers for a wealth of information and insights that they've shared with us, but also that they've been frank about the challenges that they face in the use of uh, big data, but also in operationalizing of the legal framework and uh, principles guiding it. We started to uh, receive a few questions from the audience, and we actually have one uh, clarifying question from Mr. Gomez to Mr. Pramana. Um, so, Mr. Pramana, you've uh, shared with us um, a list of um, different pieces of legislation, and Mr. Gomez is wondering whether the um, NSO um, was consulted when these uh, legal uh, frameworks were developed and adopted and what were the mechanisms behind it. As there was uh, uh, legislation on uh, one data policy on digital uh, transformation, then there is this uh, data privacy uh, bill currently uh, debated. So what was the involvement of uh, BPS in the consultation process? Could you please share a bit with us? Hello. Uh, 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 can you repeat that? Yes. Yeah. So the question, can you hear me well? Yes, yes. The question was, uh, with all the legal frameworks that you've mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, um the uh, the law on uh, uh, one uh, data policy digital transformation the data privacy bill on ai and research so what was the involvement of bps statistics indonesia was it consulted in the process and what was the mechanism for that consultation okay <laughs> so whether bps indonesia also involved on this uh of, of this uh, data yes. legislation. Okay. Yes. Uh, legislation. Yes. okay, yes, of yes. course. So, for example, even uh, big data uh, for uh, artificial intelligence and also for uh, different uh, legislation, BPS is involved starting from uh, consultations, also involved or designing the, the uh, all these uh, legislation, the content, etc., to make sure that what we expect also included in that uh, legislation. So, uh, for example, the, uh, we also have a team related to uh, artificial intelligence. And also, we, uh, our uh, legal team, uh, also with uh, our um, infrastructure team related to e-commerce uh, data. Uh, we plan, uh, we discuss uh, mostly uh, how we deal with the, uh, the e-commerce data and then how we uh, need the data for uh, public goods, especially for official statistics. So, we, we are included in all the in all the, uh, let's see, the process of this uh, legislation process. Can you hear great. Me? Yes, great. Thank you for clarifying that. Another question that we've received uh, from our participants from Indonesia, actually, is whether the use of big data through mobile phone from mobile network operators um, actually provides access to personal um, information of users, responders that uh, they would otherwise not want to share. Uh, so here I would like to address this question to our experts from the NSOs actually and better understand the mechanisms behind access to uh, private sector data because uh, we understand that there is a lot of uh, data governance involved um, in accessing admin data, data from other government entities. But then how do we deal with private sector information? And um, Mr. Whitworth uh, touched upon that, particularly on the privacy issues. But And uh, Mr. Gomez mentioned that we should have, um, NSOs should develop MOUs with third-party data providers, but could you please elaborate on 
what are the different models of access, particularly being the data integrators for the government, um, data access from the private sector. Because uh, based on our research, uh, there are several ways of accessing data, either uh, direct anonymized data or actual um, insights where the private sector and often in the case of mobile network operators where they refuse to provide access to um, the personalized raw data, but the NSOs collaborate with them to develop algorithms that then these MNOs apply on their data and they share their insights. So could maybe uh, Mr. Whitworth and Mr. Pramana share a little bit of how they how you access data from the private sector, what is the mechanism behind it, and uh, how do you ensure the, um, the privacy and ethics, and do you actually get the data into um, your systems, your big data systems to process it, and how does it relate to access to the government data? that you get on your big data platforms. Who would like to go first? Mr. Whitworth, maybe? So, yeah, I can go first. Sure. So, I, I, think, I think for us, it's about having those strong governance frameworks, um, but also being able to show, and I alluded to this in the presentation, that those are used that they're not just frameworks that sit on a uh, a website or on a on a a piece of a piece of paper because I think that's the most important thing in terms of gaining public trust around the use of of data, be it mobile phone data or or to be honest, whatever data you use, is to show that actually the principles by which you're saying you're going to use the data are actually applied in whatever the system is that you're going that you, uh, where you're where, where you're using the data so you've got a body of evidence really to point to to show that you will use that in a that, that information in a proportionate way in a transparent way uh, in only for research and statistical purposes that you know in a way that's uh, compatible with the um with the rights that you've got to you know the legal rights that you've got to use that data so i think that's the that's that's the importance really of all of this kind of work that it's not just there to be um to be spoken about and then not applied what what you what, what we found is what we need to do is is show how we apply those um those those governance principles to you know not just mobile phone data but any other type of data to 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 uh, to be honest and then the second thing i would say is is all of this is in collaboration and again i alluded to the to 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 this in my presentation i think you know it's about working in a collaborative way with with whatever with whoever your the, the data supplier is um not least to understand the data because you know you're conscious as the national statistical institute you're not the font of all knowledge on 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 all all um, all aspects of data that you know you haven't collected. So it's working with providers of data in in um in a collaborative fashion, I think, and getting that mutual trust and understanding through that through that collaboration. So transparency and transparent communication is key on that collaboration absolutely. with data suppliers. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And show it and being able to show that, you know, you're not just saying you're using the data ethically or proportionately, but actually being able to prove that you you are and having a body of evidence that, 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 that that's there to and publish to, to be able to show that. So do you publish the the algorithms? Uh, so not so much the algorithm, but it depends. It varies, to be honest. We publish the research, we publish the data we use, and we publish what that data is being used for. Um, it varies to the degree to which we we we, we publish um, based on you know from data set to data set. But uh, but yes, we we publish what data we access and how we use that data. Okay, and thank you, Mr. Whitworth. And we have Mr. Gomez who just raised his hand. Yes, Mr. thank you, Irina. Yes. Yes, can you hear me, Irina? Yes, thank you very yes. much. I, I think I think in this in this very interesting cafe we had three different optic 
of of big data, right? Or what I like to call also private third party data. I mean, one thing uh, is actually the governance of the data ecosystem, right? That's one thing, how to build trust among the different partners, how actually to support the development of a healthy and sustainable data ecosystem. In that respect, we are discussing actually the data stewardship, right? Bringing something, I mean, a, consist a consistency, coherence in all that, I mean, and making people working hard on these data. Uh, that's one thing. And there is an ethics in producing this data. So basically in collecting this data and producing the data and analyzing the data by those one that collect them directly or directly. Then the second thing that we have been discussing is the reuse of big data, right? For the reuse of big data, we have two sets of reusers. We have the member of the national statistical system that are reusing the data according to the national statistical law. The concept of confidentiality, for example, the concept of transparency, example, these one are applying to the reuse of big data by the National Statistical Office, right? I mean, this is clear since the beginning, and what we have noticed is that the principle of confidentiality is probably the most important for a national statistical office to get access to private data. That's something that is important. Then there is another use or reuse of data. There is a reuse of big data by the research community, right? Private or public. These one not being member of the national statistical system, let's say not being part or covered by the national statistical law and the UN fundamental principles. And for those one, internationally also, because you know that internationally for the National Statistical Office, we have played a leading role in trying to propose some, I would say, generic legislation and law, but for the reuse of big data by private uh, uh, searches or public searches, researchers, there we are a little bit lacking at the international level of a kind of a guidance ethics. And I was very happy to hear actually here during the, these two presentations about these concrete examples at country level, how this can be managed. But it's very important to keep these three elements in mind, also for the next days when we will have the, the, the dis further discussions about that. Thank you very much, Irina. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Gomez, for providing this, um, um, this summary and these key three points. Uh, but now that you said that, I would like to move to Ms. Mr. Pramana for, uh, for your comments. And then on the issue of uh, data privacy, my question is, uh, what principles are you guided by in the area of uh, privacy uh, for big data use in the context where you do not have the law on uh, personal data protection yet? Okay, thanks. Actually, uh, thank you, Irina. Actually, we do have uh, uh, there inside the uh, statistics uh, regulations. Also, there is the, some uh, some uh, regulation related that we cannot uh, share the information of individual information, right? So, uh, for BPS, we cannot share the individual information, and then uh, what we share into the public only the aggregate. And so uh, that's also uh, stated in the, uh, the statistics, uh, conducting statistic regulations, and all, all that is included being uh, for uh, all BPS uh, business process. Related to big data or uh, mobile network operators, which actually will be uh, discussed in detail by uh, Mutiti next, uh, uh, at the end of this year, right? uh, this month, uh, how we can uh, collaborate with the telecom. So as you mentioned that uh, we only have limited uh, data, a sample of data, and also this data already anonymized. It's only uh, some MSDN, also locations, and also the time, etc. We cannot, we cannot use that for uh, connecting that into a person, right? So based on this sample, we developed the algorithm together with uh, several researchers and also institutions, and then later 
the we implement that on the uh, uh, system of uh, MNOs and telecom and then based on that uh, algorithm we get the insight also we get the data and then the output is an aggregate uh, data so we, we cannot get the real uh, data from MNO and the algorithm is also uh, reported so but that's in in Bahasa Indonesia we have uh, how uh, uh, the algorithm being done for mobile network operators for MPD, but also some of our researchers, uh, including uh, Butiti next, uh, will also present uh, next uh, uh, start cafe, have also uh, academic paper on that. So the algorithm is also being uh, for academics uh, use also to, to check whether it's already correct or not. So that's uh, the thing for uh, related to the uh, principle of uh, personal protection. It's already embedded in the statistical uh, law, right? But then it needs to be enhanced right now related to uh, previously we have the data uh, from uh, for not only for BPS statistical law, for also for other uh, uh, third party uh, third party uh, companies or uh, parts that they need also to comply this uh, data protections. Great, thank you so much for this clarification. And um, it looks like we've exhausted all the questions from participants, but also um, even though we could talk about the uh, topic of big data governance for hours, our session is coming to an end. And it is a pleasure to see that we've had more than 150 participants connected to the session for these 90 minutes of uh, big data governance discussion. And I would like to thank um, our excellent speakers for the, sharing their experience and insights and for staying up at night and waking up very early to be with us here today. And also thank the participants for their questions. Another round of thanks goes to UNS Cup team that supported this session, especially Rike, Goy, and Kai. And we would appreciate if the participants take two minutes to provide us with feedback to the session in the evaluation form that will be shared with all of you shortly. Uh, the next Stats Cafe will focus on emerging issues in economic statistics digitalization. And in two weeks, we'll return to the big data topic uh, by discussing big data partnership models. So stay tuned and we'll see you again in the upcoming Stats Cafe. And now I would like to turn over to Rike for closing remarks. Oh, thank you so much, oh, Irina. And uh, thanks to our three excellent speakers. Uh, I had actually jotted a few points down as a summary uh, they overlap immensely with the points that were just made by Gabriel a few minutes ago, because I think that the discussion we've had here has helped us all, including myself, clarify some of the many terms and concepts surrounding big data, and, and not least when we talk about governance. I mean, the, the idea, you know, what is, what is data stewardship vis-a-vis -vis statistical authority? What is a national data strategy vis-a-vis -vis a national statistical program? What is a national statistical system vis-a-vis -vis a data ecosystem? And how do we operate within this uh, context when the job at hand is to increase the use of big data for official statistics production? And I think it is immensely important that we stay very clear about these terms because otherwise we cannot get the necessary progression in our discussions. Um, and what I was uh, just also making a note of here is uh, one of the points emphasized uh, by Simon, which was this need to move from concepts to practice. And I think it is immensely important. There's been a good reason for discussions about concepts for the past couple of years, because we are operating in such a changing data landscape and information landscape. There has been a need to be clear on concepts because things are changing. Uh, but 
we do need to find a way to take that next step. And I thought it was really useful to see some examples and tools that we can use to making this more uh, practical. Uh, for example, the extensive use by BPS Indonesia of the GSBPM framework, which as what, what's pointed out, uh, is as relevant when we talk about big data as any other data source. Um, also, the very specific guidance that we heard about that was developed for data ethics is maybe something we can talk a bit more about. Could we, could we maybe provide some guidance that could help statistical institutions assess, you know, their readiness for picking up a data stewardship role, for example? Again, in very practical terms. Uh, and I'm mentioning this as one example because I see more and more national statistical offices being put in a role by the rest of the government that actually looks like a data stewardship role, but for a national statistical office that's based on a legislation that mirrors the traditional statistics authority role, this is very difficult to grapple with. Um, so these are just some of the ideas uh, that your excellent discussion today generated in my mind. And as some of you have alluded to, these discussions are continuing over the next couple of weeks in different forums. So I very much look forward to that. Uh, lastly, I want to just uh, point out that uh, ESCAP uh, and especially us in the statistics division team are very much uh, in the big data stream also in future. It's such that we've been very strongly encouraged by all the statisticians, including the heads of all the statistical offices in Asia and the Pacific, to really provide some uh, information and also some leadership in terms of regional collaboration and regional guidance going forward. So, um, so we are certainly uh, in this uh, for time to come and I look forward to continuing to working with all of you and, uh, and uh, we also plan to reach beyond the region in continuous discussions just as we've done today. So I do want to, to thank uh, Gabriel for staying up very late while you are now falling asleep now. Maybe uh, our friend in the UK, Simon, is waking up. So <laughs> it all comes together nicely. Yeah, but thanks again, uh, all three of you. And also thank you to Irina for excellently facilitating our discussion today. So with that, enjoy your, the rest of your day, your evening, your night. Uh, and uh, we will meet us soon again to, uh, to continue this uh, debate. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.